There we are. We're alive now. I always worry with my uh, my technology these days. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Taylor Chastain Griffin. I'm the executive director of AAAIP and so excited to have this conversation today with one of our favorite people to talk to, Dr. Zini Ng. So um, you have been around with us for a long time, both at you know AAAIP helping as a subject matter expert and um, with pet partners on our human animal bond advisory board um, as a veterinary expert in the therapy animal welfare space. So we are so happy to have you today. As you log on and join us, um, let us know you're here. Put your name uh, in the chat. Maybe if you're partnering right now with a therapy animal, what field you're partnering with, what part of the world you're from, anything you'd like us to know. Um, and I'll be keeping my eye out for that chat as we talk today. Um, but first, I just want to get started by allowing you to say hi to our audience and, and to tell us about yourself and your um, professional background and why you um, are interested in animal-assisted interventions. Hello, Taylor, and hello, everyone out there on Facebook Live. It is a pleasure to be here, um, and it has always been such an honor and such a privilege to work with uh, to work with AAAIP and pet partners and all of the wonderful people who are in our therapy world and realm. Um, so as far as uh, getting started, that's that definitely opens up a can of worms of like who I am and and everything I love about animal assisted uh, animal assisted therapy. But first and foremost, and as you can see, I guess you're, you're streaming through my through my photos over here. Uh, but I'm a veterinarian first and foremost. I'm a small animal veterinarian, and um, I, ever since I was a little kid, I've always loved animals. I always knew that this was my true calling and what I have always wanted wanted to do. And where that kind of stemmed from was obviously I love uh, loved animals, but the other part of the job that I, I really recognized I love was that I love working with people. I love seeing people. And uh, ultimately, what I loved about the opportunity to be a veterinarian was my ability to help people through helping their animals. Mm -hmm. um, and so that really got me as I entered in the veterinary field. I explored a lot of different and different options and opportunities. Uh, but it really came to that calling of how animals make us feel and uh, the science of the human-animal bond. And one of my first uh, intros into animal assisted interventions of any kind was actually hippotherapy. It was that I volunteered at an equine assisted um, therapy like riding stable uh, with uh, kids with cerebral palsy and MS. And it was just absolutely amazing to be a part of that journey of healing and seeing how much that these, uh, these kids really benefited from being with with the horses and then that led me into and then I started seeing all of these areas of like kind of service animal work and of course therapy animals as well as well in that journey and I was like you know what I really love this stuff and I still want to be a veterinarian but how do I get myself involved and immersed in here and so that led me to I actually ended up doing um, a residency program and master's in human animal bond studies, where I actually did get to explore all of those areas of kind of the science of the human animal bond, studying and researching all the impacts of animal assisted interventions on obviously the people, but of course the animals. And uh, for, uh, for my perspective in being a veterinarian and an advocate for the animals, I always want to assure that kind of our interventions are always safe and happy and our animals are thriving so that both animal and human can really thrive in those situations. Uh, so that's kind of how I dove into this. So that's my short story on how I dove into this, this area um, and still continue continue to do research and teaching, and I love talking about all of, the, all of these topics. So uh, yeah, that's just a little bit of a, about me. That's wonderful. I love to hear about that and to see kind of some um, directions, like even in the veterinary field, moving towards that human animal bond, um, you know, studies. And I, I just think we've already, we've come so far even in the past 10 years and our ability to understand that bond and especially to advocate for therapy animals, you know, not as tools um, that are, you know, tolerant of the intervention, but of um, beings who consent and want to be involved um, in these interactions. So I know you have also had um, some experiences working with a pet of your own. Isn't that right? So tell us a little bit about that and what you learned when you had that kind of hands-on journey working with your own pet. 
Oh, that is for sure. Um, so yes, I, another honor and privilege in my life was having my very first uh, golden retriever. She was my, um, named Grace, and she was my first uh, dog that I actually owned uh, as an adult. Um, and uh, she taught me so much. I actually uh, adopted her because uh, she was, she came to our clinic and uh, we had diagnosed her with cancer, with cutaneous lymphoma at six years of age in a golden retriever. And sadly, at that time, we kind of knew that the prognosis was probably was not going to be good. Um, however, the owner was uh, very much about, hey, you know what, I want to try chemotherapy, let's try to um, try to do what we can to keep her happy and, uh, and healthy. And so we went ahead with that. And uh, as uh, time and treatments went on, she actually really improved um, and got better. Um, however, sadly, her owner didn't um, actually ended up suffering from cancer herself, mm -hmm. and ended up passing away. Way. And so her family really wasn't in a situation where that they could actually take care of a dog um, uh, going through chemotherapy and cancer. So they asked me if, as her doctor if I wanted to kind of keep her for that time. And of course, that's how I she actually came into my life. And I kind of expected to say goodbye to her within the first first year of her diagnosis. But surprisingly, and this is during my residency as I'm doing my human animal bond studies research, and uh, um, I kind of recognized that it would be helpful for me to go through all of the the raw emotions of saying goodbye to an animal and all of that um, on top of kind of pursuing this research in the animal assisted therapy. But shockingly, surprisingly, and faithfully uh, that Grace actually went into full remission and uh, she was in full remission for the next seven years, which uh, um, I was just incredibly grateful for. And uh, so after that first year, after she was in complete remission and like every single person who interacted with her, all of our students, um, every person that she engaged with was just like, oh my goodness, she's the most loving dog in the, in the world. She'd let you do anything and just love cuddles and kisses. And so that really uh, merged me into being like, you know what? I'm gonna, I think that this is her calling to be a therapy animal. And so um, uh, with her, we paired up and uh, we were pet partners um, and uh, got to go through that journey together. And we visited every single place, every type of person. Um, and she was just, she'll always be my heart and soul dog. Um, no, no matter what. And as far as the lessons that I learned from her, I could not name, I could write a book on everything that I learned uh, from her. But probably the one thing that kind of sticks out in my mind is that people will always greet your dog before you. Um, and that they so will real. always identify your dog before you that like you the number of people who and still to this day with my current dogs and animal companions it's always like oh my goodness grace we love you we can't we're we're so happy that you're here and then it's like oh hi dr ing <laughs> <laughs> after that fact of like yeah and i learned i was like yeah i'm not taking that for <laughs> personally um even though whenever i do show up without a dog they're always asking about where's the dog where's Where's the pup? But and it really just shows that um, these animals in our lives they become our identity and a reflection of ourselves. And it's important to be uh, proud of our animals and just make sure that uh, they are living their best lives possible. But um, I learned so much. But probably that's the biggest thing that I kind of realized is that yeah, people are definitely more <laughs> um, into our animals rather than me myself. That's so true. And I'm guilty too. Like there's so many people in my community, I can tell you their animals names, and then I have to try to remember the, the human's name. But uh, you said you could write a book based on what you learned. And I'm going to hold you to that. I think I know you're a busy guy, but I, I would love to see that book. Um, so we're going to talk more in detail at our next meeting. We're going to have a closed um, membership meeting for AAAIP members to kind of go into a more formal presentation and allow our professionals to bring questions to you. But I know that um, um, it's animal welfare in this field that we've talked about is so important. So um, just give us a, a synopsis of why that's important and what are some steps that professionals can take to you know, make sure their animals welfare is being taken care of and that even beyond that, they're really moving into a sense of thriving. 
Oh my goodness. <laughs> Another book, um, yes. multiple books uh, to really write and, and talk about. But I really feel the beginning of this really talks about that whole definition of the human animal bond being mutually beneficial. Um, and that uh, we have to know that for the benefits of the human animal bond to take place, that uh, both human and animal should benefit from that, uh, from that interaction. And I guess my first like kind of journey and glimpse into animal assisted therapy is like, oh yeah, like petting a dog, like, yeah, you get to, of course, I'm going to think about my blood pressure going down, my cortisol levels and all those cool, cool little things um, in, in people. But I always thought my first question was, well, what happens to the animal? And when I think about animal assisted therapy and kind of the, the professionals and volunteers that are in this arena, there are so many good intentions and heartfelt intentions that we want to do this. We want to share our animal with the world and help people feel, feel better, which is obviously noble and an honor to, to be able to do. But sometimes I think that, and I'm definitely seeing it, where handlers kind of put that, to wear that to badge of honor and wear that pride of being like, I'm showing off my animal and puts that above kind of, does that animal really want to be there and do this? Because I always say, I was like, you know what? Grace didn't raise her paw and say, hey, dad, I want to be a therapy animal one day. It just happened to be like, you know what? She happens to be a good dog and I wanted to do that, to do that for her. So we always have to ask ourselves like, okay, if this was the animal's choice, would they actually be doing this uh, themselves? So that kind of was the first question to kind of stir up in, in my head is that if we're going to do this appropriately um, and ensure that everybody benefits, we have to prior prioritize that animal's welfare, that their health and well-being first and foremost. And as far as kind of what to do to kind of get started or um, as far as making sure that we assure that is Honestly, it's the responsibility of us as handlers to truly know our, our animal partners, mm -hmm. that we have to know them inside and out. And most of the time, our handlers are going to be the owners of, of these animals, but we should know exactly kind of what makes them happy, what makes them upset, and what makes them stressed, and what do they look like when they are potentially stressed, uh, stressed out? Because stress is such a nuanced thing that can look quite different between, between individual dogs and other animals. So you really have to be in tune and to be a true partner with them, to really advocate for them and know them. And if you are being able to, if you are able to kind of see these kind of subtle cues, because most therapy animals that are approved and evaluated, of course, they're going to be like kind of um, those canine good citizens and yeah. be very well behaved, but that might not mean that they love what they're doing. Um, and so it's really important that people have the intuition to know when they're not loving um, what they're doing and when they're not thriving. So that's a little bit to, to kind of start. Um, yeah, before. it's so important. And we'll, we'll talk more about this in our closed session and also know, you know, as AAAIP members and um, even on for the general AAAIP website, which we'll put in the chat, we have some resources to help handlers through this, you know, body language inventories, sheets to fill out that help you identify what does this behavior and state look like in my animal as an individual. And it's so different. Like you said, I have some dogs who, um, you know, it's very hard to even see stress in the way that their body is, you know, the way they present their body. And then there's some who are very obvious. So, um, so important to know. And, and another, you know, point that you've really helped provide leadership with in the field comes to therapy animal retirement. And that's such a hard conversation. It is so hard um, to, you know, stop doing this work that's so rewarding with your animals, but um, they don't, you know, always stay um, a good fit forever. And so what are the things that you look for in your, um, your clients and as in other handlers, when you think about, is it time to consider retirement? Yeah, that is such an important question and one that we still have a lot of answers to find out, find out about. Because um, obviously during the prime of the therapy animal's life, like kind of as they're middle-aged and seasoned and do, doing really well, um, we want to know how they're feeling and what they're doing in that moment like kind of at the at their peak existence. Um, however, it's kind of when we talk about retirement, we're typically talking about, okay, are they aging out? 
what's going to be the signs like kind of a senior animal who is like, yeah, I don't really want to, this, this might not be something that we should push for, for anymore. Um, but aside from the, the, se the senior animals, I also want to note that it's not just senior animals that animals of any age can maybe that they have to warrant retirement. And it's really important to watch your animals, to, again, know those animals inside and out so you can detect when there are issues when you are actually engaged in um, animal-assisted interventions. So let's say that you know your, your animal, you know what they, that they start panting, that they'll put their ears down, that you see the whites of their eyes when they're, when they're stressed out. And if those are signs that you don't see on your regular appointments, but then you're starting to see a trend that you're gradually seeing a, like little bit by bit that they are showing you these subtle signs that, you know what, I don't really want to be here right now. Definitely, the first thing that we should do is take a break. We should know when we can take them out of the, those situations, that it's not an obligation. They're not getting paid to, <laughs> to do this, even though some of us might be. But our obligation is to, to see them first um, and to act upon, uh, act upon that first. So uh, it's about watching those subtle cues. The other thing about, and especially for our senior pets, is that we know that they're going to succumb to, they're going to have medical conditions, like usually chronic disease conditions. Probably one of the uh, top things, probably in therapy animals, is going to be osteoarthritis, where you're going to see them slowing down, they're going to have achy joints, um, and probably the other thing is probably bad breath, they, that we know that our dogs really have, like dental disease is something that we see in a lot of our aging pets. Um, and so looking for signs of discomfort and pain is really critical. And that's a really critical conversation to have with your veterinarian to kind of say, hey, you know what? This is the, the work that I do with my with my dog. They have an important role with me. Um, I'm wondering if you can give me any guidance on like, how do I know, like, because I want to make sure that I value and we celebrate our retirement in a very good, good way. So please help me understand, are there any conditions that I should be watching out for my dog that, that might tell me that, yeah, it probably is reasonable to, to retire. So um, in a nutshell, it would probably be looking at behavior, looking at their like kind of um, desire to be participating in animal assisted therapy, and then kind of what is their health, um, uh, um, their physical health. Uh, like as well. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And I, it really points to the fact why we need this community, this professional community um, to have these conversations with, because I know even with my own animals, it's like you, you don't want to admit that they're getting older. You don't want to accept that. And so having conversations with other professionals, with my veterinarians, having um, that, you know, consultation is so important. And so um, we have all, all of our AAAIP members, make sure you bring your questions. And we have our, our event next month. Um, you'll be able to ask questions questions, you know, particular to what you're experiencing with your animals um, and, and get some insight there. So I'll ask you one last question before we um, let you go and then see you again next month. But I ask this to all of our guests and love to hear the different um, answers and perspectives. So what would be your biggest piece of advice for someone who's just looking to get involved and in working with a therapy animal? Ooh, um, yeah, there, there again is so much that could be said to that as well. I guess one of the biggest things is to come into animal assisted therapy world with an open heart and open mind. Um, that uh, you're going to be, be ready to learn so much um, about you as a human being, as a professional, as a volunteer, and to know, to learn so much about your animal. And also for your heart to be open to like, just accept the smiles and the feel good of um, this, the, the benefits that you really do bring about with your like kind of best, uh, best friend um, is that, yeah, you're, you're going to, be doing a lot of good work and seeing a lot of great changes. So just to be prepared for, for anything is uh, kind of what I would say to somebody who's thinking about this. That well. is so true. I You learn sometimes, I think, more about yourself throughout this whole process. I, I always say that, as you know, Rex, my, my border collie pictured here, recently passed, and I've been thinking a lot about his legacy as a therapy animal and about how much he taught me about me. And so um, it is a journey that is definitely well worth it. And we're so thankful that you um, lend your expertise to help us all along the way. We cannot wait to have you for our closed 
member event. So we will put details in the chat about how you can join AAAIP. Um, we have monthly payment options available to make it as accessible as possible um, and to have these conversations that we need to be having as professionals to um, establish our competence and taking great care of our therapy animals. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you to everybody here. All right. Have a great uh, long weekend, everybody. Goodbye.